well, thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out on this rather cold and wet evening. It's great that spring has arrived in the United <laughs> Kingdom, isn't it? That's something that we can all be very, very grateful um, about. Well, look, I'm really delighted to be chairing um, this event. I think it's a really, really important discussion and it's very, very timely. Uh, my name is Aisha Hazarika. I used to work in politics for a, a long, long time. I'm now a political commentator and a, a journalist and a broadcaster. And I'm really interested in and often the topics that I'm discussing on my Times radio show and I'm writing about is really, I think, the issue of the day, and I'm sure all my panellists feel this way, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are watching from home feel the same way, which is we are living in an era where there is so much going on, and there's so much going wrong at the moment as well. I think we're all agreed that wherever you sit on the political spectrum, there's a lot of real anger about things right now. There's um, a lot of anxiety about how things are going in our local communities, in this country, but also geopolitics as well. There is a lot going on at the moment. And people have really strong views, understandably, and they want to voice their views, particularly in a world where social media plays a, a huge part. But how do we get the balance right of, of expressing our views really forcefully and really vigorously, but also in a way which respects other people? And in an era where we have such big philosophical, moral, ideological differences. Some of those are intergenerational, some of those are between people from different backgrounds, but we are, feels like we are living in an age of, of a lot of um, kind of conflict on big, big ideas. How do we disagree well? And that's the sort of topic that we're going to be digging into um, today. And I know that this is something that UCL has been really doing a lot of deep thinking about and they've had a whole sort of range of different events to try and probe um, these issues. And I know that um, students here feel really strongly about this, academics feel really strongly about this, and also somebody who, who kind of watches what's going on as a, as a political commentator. It's interesting, the kind of rise of the culture war issues, and it does feel that what's happening on our campuses right now have really sort of come into view, uh, and you know people are sort of really scrutinising what's happening here on, on campuses. And, and, and I think it's a really interesting um, thing to dig into. What do young people think about? What do students here think about all of this? Where's the right balance between freedom of expression, but also not sort of abusing people, or, or in terms of expressing your freedom, suppressing other people's freedom to express their views? So we're going to have a really interesting conversation, and we have an absolutely brilliant panel for you here today. I'll just introduce them and briefly. We have... Anaya Follerin Iman, who is a brilliant journalist. She's often on television. She writes really kind of thought provoking, sort of critical thinking pieces. And she's also the founder of a brilliant project called the Equiano Project, which looks at a lot of these big issues around race and identity and belonging in a modern setting. So let's have a big round of applause for Anaya. <laughs> Also delighted to have with us Dr. Caitlin um, Reger, who is Associate Professor um, and the Deputy Programme um, Director of Digital Humanities in the Department of Information Studies at UCL. And it's great to have Caitlin with us because, you know, these issues, particularly what's happening in the digital space, we just had this big landmark um, piece of legislation, the online um, sort of safety bill. So it's great to have Caitlin here. Let's have a big warm round of applause for her. And of course, we are here at the brilliant UCL, and I'm so delighted that we actually have one of its brilliant students here with us. We have Shreya Singh. She is president of UCL's TEDx Society. She's also in her final year as an undergraduate history student at UCL, and she's been telling me about the sort of daunting time she's at her life, but also the brilliant opportunities that are coming her way and how much she's enjoyed being here. So let's have a big warm round of applause for Shreya.
And finally, we have the brilliant Gina Miller. Gina is somebody who you will have seen on television, on big sort of political events, particularly around the, 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 the years leading up to the, the Brexit referendum. She's a hugely successful and influential businesswoman, but she also looked at the world and she thought, no, I think we can do better here. <laughs> Not difficult to be absolutely fair on that one, um, and became a, a really interesting sort of. You know, she made the jump from being a really successful, really well-regarded businesswoman to a really acclaimed activist. She, of course, um, did lots of brilliant campaigning in the run-up to the EU referendum. She actually made sure that sort of Parliament was sort of staying within its guardrails of, of of the law, and now she is the founder of the True and Fair Party, which is really looking to sort of try and clean up our uh, politics and she's running herself for parliament she's very much hoping to take the seat that chris failing chris grayling sorry chris grayling chris grayling chris grayling chris is um is 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 uh, she he's the current mp but he's standing down so let's have a warm round of applause for gina miller So how tonight's going to work is we're going to hear from our brilliant panellists. They're going to sort of give us a kind of an opening gambit where they're going to sort of set out their initial thoughts. Then we're all going to have a bit of a discussion for a while, but I'm really, really keen to hear from you because I think with these sort of events, the, the lifeblood of these events are you. We're really here to keen, hear, keen to hear your thoughts, your questions. There'll be a roving mic in the audience, so do um, pop your, have a think about the question you'd like to ask, pop your hand up. And for people listening um, at home, you can submit questions via Slido using the event code hashtag disagreeing well um, and the events team will pop through i have an ipad fingers crossed it's, it didn't work in the green room let's all pray that it let's all pray that it uh, works and that the it um, holds up and we're also streaming this event live on youtube so let's get cracking we've got lots of big meaty juicy issues to sink our teeth into now I want to kind of start this evening by sort of posing an exam question to my panellists. And also, you in the audience have a think about this question as well. Because I want to sort of start our conversation about the online world. Because the online world has really exploded, certainly politically, over the last decade. And I think there was a great hope when the online world materialised that it was going to revolutionise how we did our politics, it was going to democratise things, it was going to, you know, demolish inequalities, it was going to transform society. And here we are a decade on, and I'm asking my panels, how do you think it's going so far? <laughs> um, and I'm going to start with you. Nice, easy question. <laughs> um, so, a few points. I mean, it's interesting because now we're in the very nascent stage of talking about artificial intelligence. And there is this split in the discussion. There are some who think that it's going to transform how uh, work is done. Productivity is going to increase. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities. And there's also those who believe that um, it's going to bring essentially the end of the world. So when it comes to technology, I always think that there is this, um, there's, there's going to be the good side and there's going to be the bad side. And I think similar with social media and the online world, undoubtedly it has you know, transform society. All of us have uh, a phone in our pockets and that, that's pinging off um, every few minutes. And many of us feel that, you know, we couldn't even live without it because it connects us to our families and friends in ways that previous generations couldn't imagine. And I think that that has brought lots of benefits. Um, similarly, whilst we can talk about social media and the media, I think one of the things that's been very interesting and exciting over the last few years is the explosion of podcasting and, and uh, substacks and spaces where conversations that were previously restricted um, to institutions or media, legacy media and places of authority, um, they had a kind of monopoly on how conversations were had. And actually many people are exploring different ways of having conversations, different ways of exploring issues that may not necessarily be represented. So I do think that there are many positive elements of the internet and the online world and many negative. But just to round off my point, is I do think that with that, we can't forget the 
real world. And I think there is now a movement of people that are saying, even for young people uh, under 16s, is it actually right that they have social media? Is it right that they have the internet? Because we do understand those downsides. And it is a process. We should still preserve the places that we have um, in person to have those real conversations that take us outside of our bubbles, our echo chambers, um, our identities, and actually bring us together as citizens uh, where we see beyond those particular avatars that we have on the internet. Um, but I think that with any technological development, it is, there's good sides and there'll be bad sides. Very nuanced, Tate, though. That's <laughs> no, very, very, very good. Um, Kate, let me come to you next on this. So I think it's actually worth taking your question back sl slightly further than a decade to two decades, to 2002, with the launch of the BlackBerry smartphone. And what that device did was it pioneered portable internet. And it changed our work culture. And if BlackBerry changed the way we work, then five years later, the iPhone changed the way we live. And the iPhone did that by pioneering a touch screen. And that touch screen gave birth to a boom in application development. And those applications led to unprecedented levels of connectivity and collectivity. We saw huge developments in citizen journalism. We saw digital activism emerge. And people, regular people were given platforms to speak from like never before. But with those platforms and with that new sense of voice, people were made more accessible than ever before. And with that accessibility came a plethora of ethical issues. And everyone in this audience will know what I'm talking about. They will have different reference points for those ethical issues. They might think about what Eli Perezer calls the U-loop, so the algorithmic feeding of culture so you no longer have spontaneous cultural inputs, or what we call information silos. We might think of the marketization of self and the fact we were never meant to look at our faces this much. Or you might think about the way that it's changed our relationships and the way we even have sex. I mean, we only need to look to the Children Commissioner's report from last year, which says that by the age of 11, one in four boys will have consumed often violent pornography, and there is a rise in domestic violence in teen relationships to be very concerned about that. But the overarching change that links all of these ethical issues is that social media changed the way we think. It changed the way we consume information and process information. And that makes it much bigger and much more significant than changing the way we work or even changing the way we live. Because to change the way we think is to change us. It's to change our taste formation, what we think is good and what we think is bad. And it changes the way we formulate our beliefs, political or otherwise. That's what my current research is on at the moment. And when, we, when I was working on the online harms bill, what we were thinking about. And I think we all need to consider if we're comfortable with that. And I think what I hope we get to tonight is that we really start to question if we're happy with that exchange. Thank you, um, Caitlin. So much food for thought. That's so interesting what you're saying about the iPhone. I remember I kind of quite resisted getting an iPhone for you, just I'm a bit of a Luddite. And then when I got one, um, somebody said to me, 
And at the time, I thought it was just like a really cute comment, but actually it was very friend. It said, once you get an iPhone, particularly with all the, you know, the sort of more advanced one, they said, you'll never be, you'll never be alone again. And I thought, oh, that's dead nice. Cut to my screen time. Your average screen time is 27 hours a day. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's, that's not good. That's not healthy. I know that you develop feelings of love for it. I know. Because I have to take mine everywhere it. with me. You stroke yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Separation anxiety. But look, plenty to dig into. Lots of food for thought there. Think of your questions um, for uh, Caitlin. Shreya, I'll, I'll come to you um, next. W where do you think we are sort of, you know, a decade and even, even more on from the sort of the, the kind of birth of the online world? So I think I'll take a focus on social media specifically. Um, I think in theory, social media provides a really great platform for things like democracy and debate um, in theory. But I think in reality, with the way that social media has developed over the past 10 years or so, um, I don't think these um, positive aspirations that we would have had for social media have really materialized. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with algorithms and the way that we use social media. So. I mean, you know, sites like Instagram and Twitter, they really want to keep the user engaged for as long as possible. And so that means when you open these apps, the first thing that you see is exactly what you want to see. Um, so you see things that reaffirm your worldviews and your opinions and don't really challenge the way that you think. And I think what's happened is that it's led to a reduction in critical thinking. It's been very detrimental when it's come to debate. Um, a lot of people take the things that you see on social media at face value. Uh, that's very concerning, I think, with the rise of misinformation, but also with the fact that a lot of people my age use things like Twitter and Instagram as their primary and sometimes only source of news consumption as well. And I think another thing that's happened is that people are becoming increasingly less tolerant to, um, to different perspectives and understanding the rationale behind different debates. I'm not saying you have to necessarily agree with them, but just extending that understanding and trying to understand where people are coming from when they're presenting their opinions. I think that has really reduced because of social media and the way that it's become so polarized. And I think even in an ideal world where you had, where, where, where say you have no misinformation, as long as social media is the echo chamber that it is, I don't think it's the best um, platform for things like debate and um, getting rid of inequalities just because I don't think the conditions are there. They could be, but the way that social media sites develop apps like Instagram and Twitter, I, I think it's becoming an increasingly polarized situation because of that. Yeah, some really, really important points there. And I think something which I really um, resonate with what you've said there is about how, look, we're living in a very polarised world anyway, and our politics have definitely become more, everything has become more polarised. It'll be interesting when we have a bit of a discussion to sort of dig into the effect, you know, how much has social media sort of added to, to that um, kind of tension. Um, Gina Miller, your thoughts? Um, hard to follow, <laughs> Caitlin, I have to say. Um, some thoughts for me is, if we go back to the beginning, I would go back to even before uh, 20, uh, 2002, and say, if you think of the origins of Facebook being about connecting people in universities, and the internet being about government resources, uh, 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 researchers sharing information, they really did not know what they were actually developing. And this is the thing I hear from, from technolo uh, technology gurus all the time, is we're not sure what's going on at the moment. And that's a terrifying thought. Um, the algorithms, so everything is moving at a pace that's so much faster than they thought that it, it would. Um, and the manipulation of minds is something I think we have to be really fearful for, of because that is actually what it's doing. You don't know it's doing that to you. I mean, what really amazed me about um, the way Apple did things and, and the touchscreen is actually intuitively a baby knew, some, you know, an eight-month-old knew how to use the screen and which way to swipe. So the fact that they actually understood human behavior to that extent was quite extraordinary, the amount of effort that had gone into do that. And so the manipulation of, the, of human minds and emotions, it's something that is changing us and I think that's what's so scary is the idea that we think we're in control 
and we're not in control. And that's the algorithms are choosing to manipulate us in certain ways, and they're going to carry on doing that. But if I could just pin down for my day from, from news, um, there's good and bad in this, in that um, you know, one of the things that happens is that news headlines now, and the sub has become so much bigger, because actually that's where you're consuming your news, is on the mobile. So people aren't reading the rest of the article. So the idea of debate and discussion and information is not happening because they're reading literally the headline and the sub, and that's it. And they, that's now where they are becoming more and more politicized and more and more aggressive and more and more pitting people against each other and the culture wars are happening in the headlines because nobody then gets to the details. And newspapers are getting away with it because they can cover themselves off that actually read the rest of the article, we put both sides, whatever it is. I have made 11 complaints to Ipso on this. I know what I'm talking about. They get away with it all the time. Um, but the other thing is about the manipulation of democracy, and I call it coding for chaos, because I really don't think we have begun to understand how, you know, think about the way people behaved in before they had the tool of the internet and digital and technology. When you had an autocrat or a dictator who used the old playbooks, in, you know, be it 1920, 90, 30, whatever, and they now have an internet. They have the tools to make, you know, what the phrase says, to get, you know, a lie around the world before the truth has got its boots on. Well, that's now happening in nanoseconds, not in a day or a few or however. You know, all of the, all of the good and the bad has been amplified and expedi expedited at such a stage that how do you then combat that? Because then it's being embedded in people and they're thinking, that's it, that's the truth. And then you get another and another algorithm then drawing you down to something that confirms where you are. Now... This debate about disagreeing well, uh, um, one of the things I'd say is we don't leave the medium. Because there's two things here. It's a message and the medium. And the medium is now so powerful that it's overtaking the message. And so I would say that we need to not leave the platform because we have to stay and disagree. Because one of the things I worry about is that the bullying that's happening online and the misogyny and all the isms that are happening online means that good people who want to debate and want to be there and should be there and part of the, the discussions are now leaving the arena, as it were, are leaving the online arena. And that is terrifying because we've got to be there. And I'll just give you two stats before we broaden out the debate. On the day, um, on the 13th of November 2017, when the High Court gave me my, my first decision, um, the University of Central Lancaster did some work on this and some studies on this, on me being the most hated woman. And the fact is I had... 470,000 um, you know, abuses that day. It was quite extraordinary. But the fact is, there were another 9,000 that were then kept mining them. There's this mining of things. So the mining then makes other people think, and then within 24 hours, the death threat started. So there was a direct correlation between what was happening and the mining of those negatives that were being put up and then, then amplified. And the idea that, you know, mistruths that I wasn't even British, that I didn't have a British passport. And so those, that mistruth went there. This foreigner is telling us what to do. And that's a real case of how it worked. And that was in 24 hours, because when we started the case, the hate was 3% on my online media platforms. So it went from 3% to almost 89%. It was extraordinary in a very short space of time. So if this is the thing, you can pick on people and you can shut down debate and you can shut down people who are actually wanting to bring the other side of the argument to the platform. And that's where we haven't got onto this yet, but I'm sorry, it's cowboy land and we have got to hold those with the deepest pockets who are making all the money. Um, they, you, we've got to get them into a mindset that they are responsible because they know, this whole idea, they don't know what they're doing and they can't control it. I mean, to some degree, I think they can, and I'm, I'm one, I'm sure with this, with this, you know, I think the online um, act that was passed um, is actually toilet paper. And I think it's um, really, it's, uh, and it should, it, it's a disgrace that the lobbyists with deep pockets got so much good stuff that's in there taken out. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to all of that, I'm sure. Okay, well, thank you. Before we broaden out the conversation, I just want to come back to you, um, Gina. A very interesting point you said about the, the design for a child. I do remember a friend of mine saying that her baby was looking at her face and literally trying to yeah. sort of swipe it because that's sort of that's the that's the mentality. But when you have been, and I have, and I'm sure many of us on this panel have been the subject of one of those horrible pylons. And 
just describe to our audience what that is like on a kind of an emotional level and even a sort of physical... Because when it's happened to me, it actually, even though I'm tough as old boots and all that kind of thing, it actually has quite... You, you have a physical reaction to it. How, how, what's it like? It's um, two things I'll, I'll explain. My children told me when it was at its worst time that I changed. Um, and they told me I became tough and that wasn't me, that I stopped being their loving mum. Because what I did was I put up all this, because I'm as, I'm as tough as boots do, but I put up, you unconsciously put up barriers. And so you, you're protecting yourself. You know, because you, and that protection, I wasn't aware that it had changed my physical and mental state and, and my psychology. So the way I was ready for the hate. So I was always on high alert and prepared for hate. So that, that changed the way I was as a person, which I wasn't aware of until they told me that. So that's one, one thing I wasn't aware of. Um, and now the other thing I do, which I've now decided to do, is I actually deliberately pick people and I go back in the conversation. So on the pile and stuff, I'll go... I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so, you know, somebody who's raising money saying, go back home or whatever it is, I'll send them... A, uh, I'll respond and say, that's very kind of you, thank you very much, but um, rather than the thousands, you can... It's my taxi fares 40 pounds so you know and I'll use humor and do that sort of thing because I won't leave the stage that's one thing I decided I won't do I will go and I choose and I think using humor and going and, and, and maybe pushing back on some of the the untruths but in a respectful way I do take the time to do that because I think it's important because these are people too and I think that's the thing we forget sometimes is that it's you know there are people, forget the, the bots and the algorithms and those sorts of things, there are people there on the other side of that. And if we need to connect, we need to connect with people. And I just, I'm picking up from that. I mean, mm. it feels like one of the themes, you know, you made a nuanced argument saying that there's good and there's bad. And I think there is, there is a lot of good in social media as well. It has engaged a, a lot of um, people. But where does the right balance lie? Because a lot of social media has... All our panellists have said, and I'm sure you've got your own thoughts on this, is sometimes designed, A, you have an echo chamber, but it is also designed to have a chilling effect as well, to sort of sort of censor people or kind of don't say that because we are going to attack you and, you know, it, it has a, a, a deep effect. Where, where do you think the sort of balance lies? It's interesting because I think, you know, I, I go back... So I, I, I'm not a particular fan of Elon Musk, but I do think that there's something very interesting that happened when he took over Twitter... And I think in terms of your attitude to social media, I also think it slightly depends on what your political opinions are. So I remember before Elon Musk took over, there were many debates where um, people that um, I'm interested in, that I don't necessarily agree with, but I, I think that they should have a platform to have conversations, felt that during social, social media was already censored, that social media was already a very uh, stringent place to have certain debates. I remember uh, many... Uh, gender-critical feminists were often uh, removed from social media platforms if they expressed certain opinions about the gender debate. I remember people that um, had expressed scepticism about certain COVID-19 mitigation strategies. I think it was an official policy of YouTube and, and Facebook and Twitter that if you disagreed with the government strategy on, on lockdown, then you would be removed from social media. So I think, you know, at least... From my perspective, when I think of certain um, difficult debates that have been had within society, um, the previous model of censorship and regulation of those conversations often meant that people moved into uh, even deeper echo chambers where those conversations were being had in the dark away from public debate and also fed into a sense of powerlessness and anxiety and conspiratorial thinking because people started to think, well, there's these uh, shadowy elites in these dark rooms that are regulating what can and cannot be said um, on public discourse. So I think that I, 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 when we're talking about the balance, um, I often think that I, I still veer on the side of let's try and open it up as much as possible because there are also negative downsides when we try and hyper-regulate. And I think, at least for me, the solution to, or at least part of the solution, is um, modelling respectful, open discourse, 
in person. So when I was in university, I graduated in 2019, that's when I started freedom of speech advocacy, because actually the institutions like the university uh, were often spaces where debates were being shut down, whether that was debates on all sorts of important moral and cultural issues. So when we can't even model in-person discussion um, on thorny issues, a free-for-all space like social media is even more difficult. Um, so I think that the, the balance starts when we actually make freedom of speech and open dialogue central to how institutions operate and the spaces where citizens across divides can engage with political discussion. And then I think we actually have a much better model of how we do that in the online world. Caitlin, just picking up on what Anaya said there, I mean, that is something I hear a lot, which is, and I think post-pandemic as well, that's exacerbated things because, of course, the, you know, the black mirror in our hand became the sort of public square, didn't it, in terms of that's where people felt a sense of connection, kinship, often when they were very lonely and going through this very difficult time. But one of the things that I definitely find, to Anaya's point, is that people find it quite difficult in real life to have difficult discussions. And we're almost kind of programmed, you know, don't, you know, don't like the dinner party, don't discuss politics, don't dus discuss religion, don't discuss all of these. But if you come to my house, we get drunk, we discuss politics and religion and nothing else, <laughs> by the way, it's an absolute riot. Um, but how do you think that we can try and have these, because we are in this, I think we're in a period of intense conflict of big ideas, but I don't always think that's a bad thing because life is a contest of ideas. Politics is a contest of ideas. But academic debate is a contest of, of big ideas. How do we have these debates in real life? Because I think, to a nice point, a lot of people find they have the confidence to say stuff on, on social media because they wouldn't have the confidence or they wouldn't have the space to do it in real life. Yes. Um, so... When we talk about protecting free speech or academic freedom in the digital space, we're really speaking about maintaining the internet as a free space that is unregulated by someone like a commissioning editor. That's what makes the internet awesome, right? That's what makes it different from the radio or from television in that it's a free space and within reason, pretty much anyone can say within reason, pretty much whatever they want. The rub, of course, and this is what Gina was expressing, is that when we speak about online safety, we're speaking about the individual receiver and the direct targeting of an individual receiver in a way that causes harm. And that can take very different shapes. That can look like harassment and abuse, which disproportionately impacts women and minorities, as, as Gina has discussed, which can be terrible. It can look like digital flashing, uh, which my colleague and Jessica Ringrose and I just fed into the digital flashing legislation. We just had our first conviction last week. Um, or it can look like an algorithm feeding harmful content to a child or to a vulnerable individual. What we try, you know, I fed into a few different pieces of the online harms bill. I agree with Gina that it does not go far enough and that it falls short. The reason it falls short is that although it seeks to protect that individual receiver, it is mostly focused around illegal content or very extreme content. And one thing that a, a report that came out that a colleagues and I wrote just a couple weeks ago shows is that it's actually, a lot of the harm is through dosage, which is exactly what Gina was saying. It's through repetitive, repetitive 
high, high dosages of something that may be soft misogyny or soft self-harm. Things that actually aren't triggered by moderators and things that aren't covered by the new Online Safety Act. And that's actually what causes the real harm and changes our behavior and how we feel about ourselves. And so the current Online Safety Act says things like we should be able to, regulators should be able to ask social media companies how their algorithm works. I don't think they should be asking. I think this is so important that they should be dictating. They should be using concepts like dispersion, which makes harmful content harder to find. They should be engaged in the development of the community guidelines, which actually decides what is harmful. At the moment, social media companies call people like me, but I think it should be regulators who have a say in this. And if you regulate it in that way, the actual nuts and bolts of the algorithm, then you could maintain the beautiful things of the internet around free speech, whilst also protecting the direct targeting of individuals in order to cause harm. And I think that's where we need to be. It's a, the idea of regulation is a, is a really interesting one. And I suppose one of the questions is, who does the, the regulating? Because it'll be no state secret to the people in this room. Politicians are not brilliant when it comes to technology. I, for example, when I was a special advisor, I remember, I think it was like Google, Google came in to see us and it was like sort of stormtroopers, like the most kind of like terrifying people, like flew over from Silicon Valley, like, kind of coming in. And then they were, they were meant to be doing like a presentation for us. And of course, we didn't even know the Wi-Fi code to get them on the line. I was thinking, yeah, we're not going to be doing a great job in terms of like regulating these people. So briefly, just going back to you, who, 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 are, who are the right people to, you know, to do the right regulation? Because that's what the kind of collective ignorance of policymakers and politicians and journalists and, that's what these guys kind of rely on, right? I know. It's, right now, we kind of have these two pillars. We have big tech and we have policy. And then you have kind of like little people like me running back and forth trying to brief between the two. I think we need to be much better at building knowledge exchange pathways between those two pillars. Because at the moment, humans are falling down that gulf. But it's hard, and it's done issue by issue. So around the digital flashing legislation, my colleague, Professor Ringrose and I, who's also here at UCL, we went into schools. We talked to young people. We had a giant study. We then published the study through the Association of School and College Leaders, which went out to college leaders. We then go on the news. I get kicked off the morning breakfast television for saying the word dick pic. I, you know, <laughs> people are shocked to hear this level of abuse that's happening. People are totally freaked out. Then finally, it leads into legislation, and now, two years later, we have our first conviction. That is one issue. That's just one issue. That's just dick pics, right? <laughs> there are so many other issues that I see all the time that actually make me, as a mother, so worried. And so there needs to be more effective pathways which bring together, and I'm hoping that some of the work that's being done at the UCL Policy Lab can do this, that bring together policy, big tech, and academics doing research. And also I think parents groups are really important within this as well, that we sit together and we're actually sharing collective knowledge more effectively. Because at the moment, I find it tiring. <laughs> it's a lot of running around. Well, thank goodness you are there running around. And, and, and let's give a round of applause for that amazing work on all that Caitlin's been doing. Um, sure, I want to come back to something that, that you said, which I think is really stuck in my head about the, you know, you said it, it's not the utopia it was meant to be. And you think it's really reduced people's ability to do critical thinking. And I, I think there's a lot in that. And we have this kind of... Um, 
social media and, and politics, maybe th through social media, it's almost like a sort of footballification of, of, of politics and, and these issues. Just talk to us as somebody who is, you know, you're, you're a student, you probably have strong views on things, your, your fellow colleagues probably do as well. How do you think social media has sort of reduced your ability to sort of do critical thinking? Because many people look at social media and think, gosh, it's this kind of font of all knowledge. You can access all these amazing minds and articles. But I think you're right. Talk to us a bit about what, what you mean by that. So I think there's so many different perspectives you can access on social media. But the issue, like I mentioned before, is that you don't really come across them very much because of the way that the algorithms have been refined. And I think a really big issue is that people are becoming very intolerant to the idea of tolerance itself uh, when it comes to thinking about you know, why um, people have different perspectives. You know, on Twitter, you might come across um, an opinion that's quoted by someone else. And then you click on that, and you go into the comments, and you see you know, a lot of people reaffirming probably what you yourself think, as opposed to clicking on the quote itself. Um, and I think that. Um, that happens on all of the social media platforms. You're constantly coming across discussions that you agree with. And I think it's just very detrimental um, when it comes to you know, having more nuanced discussions, deepening a debate. People are very quick to attack opinions um, and attack, you know, attack and disagree with and just dismiss the idea that there is a rationale behind what other people are thinking. And I think that idea of there being you know, different rationalities is really important because the way that I was raised at home, my parents always sort of encouraged me to think, you know, yes, you may think this, but what is the other side of it? What, what about this? What about that? And that doesn't really happen on social media very much anymore. People aren't really encouraged to think um, why other people have got to the point with those opinions. And it's not, you know, some random opinions here and there. It, it, when you're thinking about political debates, there's a huge chunk of the population that may see things in a certain way, and people are just not uh, willing to understand the, the process that goes into getting to that point. And even when you think of things like um, structured, traditional debates, often you're told to think of, um, you know, when you're thinking of the rebuttal, you're, th you're told to think, why, why do you think the other side is thinking that way? Incorporate that into your own argument. That doesn't happen on social media, I don't think. So, and in your um, time being a student, do you think are you having big, sometimes difficult conversations in real life with, with, with your? Are you are you sort of coming up against views that you might not agree with, but you're finding a way of finding common ground, or you you might have a, a difficult conversation with a colleague or a fellow student. Does that happen in real life, do you think? Um, I try to. I think when you, um, when you think about like university um, environments, I actually don't think it happens very much. Um, and I know there have been some legislation provisions um, that have been introduced to try and make universities an environment where this isn't happening and we're trying to open it up back into debate. And I don't think it's been happening. I wouldn't even have realized that there had been legislation regarding that had I not looked it up, because I don't think it has really made a difference in real life. Um, and I mean, I do try to have those discussions. For example, in the society I'm in, we had an event a while back where we discussed colonialism. Um, growing up, I hadn't really seen any other perspectives other than the fact that it was bad, um, and that was all I'd really been exposed to. But there were some people who came to this event who had very different opinions, and the role I took on in that event was moderator. Um, but something I've reflected on quite a lot since that happened is when I talk about it, I tell people, you know, I would have reacted very differently if I was a participant. And I, I was trying to think, like, why actually, why would I have reacted very differently if I was a participant? And I realized. Even sometimes in real life, people are quite combative. Like um, most of the time, I think people do try to avoid those discussions in like university seminars. Um, it does, you know, they do get avoided quite a lot. But when you do address those issues, I think sometimes people, even in real life, can become very reactive and driven by an emotional response. Um, and that's what happened in that event. I realized had I been a participant, I would have been very emotional in the way that I reacted um, in a similar way probably that I would have on social media. But as a moderator, I was considering, you know, why is this person thinking this way? And I think that is what we should be doing. But I don't think it happens in real life or on social media. No, I think that's really interesting. Um, Gina, I just want to come to you. Look, we are in a really, really important 
election year, I think sort of half the world's population are going to the ballot box. And of course, we have a really important election. I don't know, I still have a feeling it might even be January 2025. I'm just putting it out there. Don't, don't shoot the messenger, I'm just saying. But we have got a really important election coming up here, of course. America, very important election. What do you think... Look, this is going to be a pretty dirty election campaign anyway. We, we know that. The stakes are incredibly um, high. There's a lot of money being pumped in. But social media has given politics a completely different sort of um, dimension now. What are your kind of, I suppose, I'd say hopes, I'm not sure if you have my hope, but your fears for, for how social media is going to shape uh, this next election and the ability to debate... Uh, in this election, when there is um, the ability to manipulate information, to you know put out misinformation, to distort facts as well, and when people have a very short attention span on social media, it's interesting because Oxford University actually did an, an analysis. It's called um, "A Mile Wide, an Inch Deep" about um, your social media use in the 2019 general election and the use of misinformation. And I do have, and I'll give you some positive news from the report, is that only 4% of Conservative voters and 2% of Labour voters actually relied on the sources they saw purely online to vote. So that's good news, but that wasn't the ads, because they had much more influence than the news articles or clips. So one of the things I'm very disappointed in, and uh, you know, as a political party I think we need to have, is regulation of political advertising, because we don't in this country, which is crazy. Every other form of advertising is regulated, but not political advertising. You know, so why, why is it the only one, probably the most important one you could argue, or one of the most important ones, and it's not regulated? So we do have to have that. Um, at the moment, I think the Conservatives are spending about 12,000 a day on, on uh, Facebook ads alone, much less elsewhere. Um, the, the, the amount of money that's going to be spent is unfair in our democracy because not everybody has the same pot to spend, so that already creates uh, um, you know, an unfair um, playing field. But also the, the fact that um, the way that they can use that money to hire people like akin to Cambridge Analytica. By the way, Cambridge Analytica were... Um, uh, credited with doing lots of things they couldn't actually quite do. But it wasn't quite, quite, quite as, they weren't quite the geniuses, but they did do, they claim it, yeah. But, you know, lots of other people were doing things like that. But the ability to not just our UK politics to poison the well, it's other countries. And we know that from what happened in Spain, we know that what happened in Brexit, we know that what's happened in Northern Ireland, in Russia. It's not just uh, domestic actors, it's also international actors that can actually, you know, uh, damage our democracy. We know that, for example, the Electoral Commission, that all our electoral role was, you know, hacked um, and accessed by China. So it's, it's, it, it's very worrying that how many people can destabilise our democracy. So I think, for me, it's getting the, the conversations on the doorstep, face-to-face, person-to-person, um, and not dry, just relying on social media. And I think people are beginning to get there. And I can tell you from knocking on doors, people are getting to that. There's two things we haven't brought up this evening. I do want to bring up, though, on a wider um, basis of the wider discussion, which also brings in uh, politics, is the dark web. Because we're talking about the bit we can see. I cannot find anybody who can really explain to me <laughs> what exactly the dark web is. How you get, I know how you get into how you get out of it and things, but what exactly is it doing? I mean, there's so many questions about the fact that we think we know what's happening on the surface. It's an iceberg. We know that much. We don't know the rest of it. That's one thing I'd say. The other thing is the effect on the mental fragility of our population of social media is something that is hugely damaging. And I'll just give you, you talked about being a mother, being terrified. It's actually one of the reasons I've so I always said I'd never become a politician, I'm going to politics because I'm terrified. I have two daughters. One, my eldest daughter has special needs, who is 35 soon, her age is five or six. She was caught by groups online who were specifically targeting people with special needs for grooming and um, uh, grooming gangs and paedophilia. Specifically targeting because they can find who they are and then building avatars so they looked like 12, 13-year-old kids talking to them until I took Facebook to task and they wouldn't take it down. Basically, it turned out to be a 42-year-old who was part of a paedophile ring. 
So that's the sort of thing that's happening when you talk about flashing. This is an example of what's happening. My youngest daughter during lockdown, I discovered there are things called cutting rooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cutting rooms are where there's a competition to see how you can cut yourself and harm yourself. And this is 9, 10, 11 year olds, all the way down. The third one, sorry, on WhatsApp is the groups of children as young as five who are buying slingshots and now have competitions to sue with, see which animal they can kill or maim, birds, fawns, frogs, anything. The platforms know all these things are happening. They know they're happening. That's the sort of regulation that we need to see to close down these things. They can't tell me they don't know they're there. Look, that's very powerful points there. Um, I'm just um, conscious of time, and I do want to bring the audience in because I'm sure lots of people um, in the audience have got questions that they'd like to pick up from the conversation we've had, or you may have separate questions that you want to put to the panellists. Of course, if you're watching online, please do submit your um, questions via Slido. So if we can have the lights up um, a wee bit, and let's have a look and see if anybody has any questions. We have some roving mics um, around. Does anyone have any questions? Ah, gentleman in the middle there with a the white shirt. You keep your hand up, sir, so we can thank you. Hi, my name's Stephen, so I'm trying not to be anonymous. <laughs> um, I don't tend to use social media, and the little bit that I do, I keep it on a separate phone with a false name, because I don't want my privacy uh, invaded by cookies and goodness, cross-website tracking, etc. But a, a great deal of what you're talking about seems to come down to the fact that people think they can say what they're like so long as no one knows who they are. And the, 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 the difficulty is that um, in a benign democracy like we have, is anonymity a good idea? But in a non-benign democracy, is it still a good idea? Many, many years ago, um, you could have your name taken out of the telephone directory and become ex-directory. It made part of my work quite difficult when I was trying to make contact with people. In Italy, if you wanted to do that at that time, you had to go to the police and give them a damn good reason. Um, in other words, in our benign democracy, and it still is a benign democracy, is anonymity and non-attribution of what you are saying okay, a good idea. Yes, Stephen, thank you very much. It's a great question about anonymity. Um, any other... Uh, yep, yeah, there's a lady over there with the white jumper on. Yep. We'll just group them. We'll take sort of two at a time. Um, hi. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask... What's your what, name? Maria. Thanks, Maria. Um, so, so I'm Russian, and we have Instagram banned... But there are still people on Instagram, obviously, and they're also posting in Russian. Um, and so when you speak about the regulations, so how do you, what, what do you think needs to happen for those regulations to work across, well, and my country is not the only one who's done that, right? Well, China's too, right? So it, does this regulation need, need to apply to only where the app is allowed to be used? Or does it apply where it's not supposed to be used? And how can you regulate something that's already being used illegally? And who is going to regulate that? Okay, great question, Maria. Thank you. We'll take questions at two at a time. I probably won't get everybody to answer every question because I want to try and get through lots of questions. But on the issue of anonymity, Stephen, what, what do you think here, Anaya, about that? Because I've heard the anonymity argument go both ways. Yeah, I think um, it, it's definitely something that keeps coming up. I think that, I mean... On social media, I see lots of people that do have their names and identities public that are also contributing to um, abuse and, and things like that. So I, I would worry that um, you know people see the anonymity issue as a kind of panacea. And at the same time, there are, um, as I've, I think, alluded to in the conversation, um, there are genuinely real reprisals that people might face if they are public with views that um, may well be... Uh, 
pretty reasonable. So I think that there are some reasons why people um, have a legitimate reason to keep their name um, and, and their identity concealed. And those are just in the kind of democratic sphere. But we know that people um, that come from much more uh, despotic and anti-democratic regimes often have that anonymity in order to raise awareness of particularly human rights abuses and, and difficulties that they may face. So I do think that anonymity um, can may well actually also be a way for much more people to um, be involved in the conversation, just because if they had their identities public, then they would feel too fearful, not because they're doing anything wrong, but because of the backlash, judgment, or, um, or even genuine persecution that they may face for their views. Um, so I, I think it is, a, is an interesting point, but I would, um, I'm quite sceptical about the idea that anonymity as such is um, the problem. Interesting. Um, Shrey, I'll come to you. What do you think about this concept of anonymity? Do you think anonymity would solve a lot of the problems? Um, I don't necessarily think so. I think I agree with what, what Anaya has just said, and I think... Um, when you're anonymous online, I do think um, you know you think of keyboard warriors, people saying um, a lot of a lot of things that they perhaps wouldn't if people did know their identity. But then at the same time, like you said, there's people who still say things even when you can look up exactly you know who they are, uh, where they're from, um, and I think the issue is not necessarily being anonymous or not anonymous. I think it's the way that you. Um, I, it's the way that you act. It's the way that you get your opinions across. Um, so, so I think, I think uh, also, like you've mentioned, there are certain groups of people um, uh, whose identities, it, it's quite important that they remain anonymous. Um, people who might be exposed to discrimination, who would be um, compromised if their identities were to be revealed. Um, so it's a very complex discussion. Um, I think the funda fundamental issue, like I mentioned um, before as well, is the way that people interact, um, not necessarily whether they're anonymous or not, but it, it like, creates quite a nuanced okay. discussion. Um, on the issue, uh, to Maria's point about effective regulation, um, Caitlin, what, what do you, there's a really interesting question that Maria Rose proposed. Yeah, so I can't speak too much to the Russian context, but generally when we're talking about regulation of social media, we're talking about country-specific regulation around the usages of social media. Um, and a lot of the advocacy that's happening at the moment from parents groups like Smartphone Free Childhood, who I do some work with, uh, that advocacy is actually just about making social media accountable to, act, to, 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 to actually enforce their age restrictions, which is currently not happening. So we say, oh, these apps are not acceptable for under 16s or under, under 14s. There's very little that's being done at the moment to enforce that. So some of it's just as simple as that. I think the other thing, and there's a lot of talk at the moment about smartphone bans, um, and whether that should happen for under 16s. I think where we want regulation to go, really, is for us to start looking at this as a public health issue. So in the same way we offer guidance to pregnant women about healthy consumption when they're pregnant, we should be offering that guidance to parents of children and also to our entire population. Uh, Another thing that my team and I are working on at the moment, and the Shadow Education Minister has pledged to put this into the curriculum, um, is that we start to really make digital literacy a lot easier to understand. At the moment, it's not. So we take a digital nutritionist approach. So we use an old-fashioned food guide. We break down typologies of usage. So socialization, um, we talk about creativity, we talk about education. There's lots of great things that happen on social media and that just like food, it's the way in which it is processed by way of algorithms that can render it unhealthy or harmful. 
I think it's that approach where you shift a culture, you get, have regulators involved in actually shifting the culture around that consumption that will actually make a bigger difference. Okay, that's good. So it's a good thing. Snack, don't binge. Everything in moderation, basically. Um, Gina, do you want to just come back on, on the issue? Because you've, you've made a very powerful case about um, what a terrible story about your daughter, so I'm so sorry about that. But just to, about regulation, what, where do you think the sweet spot is in terms of getting better regulation? Um, so can I just go back to the anonymity yeah. point? Actually, the evidence shows that people behave very differently when they're anonymous. There's so much research. It's almost, you know, it, 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 it's not a question. But the moderation of if somebody actually is suffering from domestic violence, is a whistleblower or whatever, there are channels to go through which you can actually check them and make sure they're anonymous. The platforms can do that. It is not as hard as people are talking about. It, it is possible to actually respect privacy when somebody needs it because they're vulnerable or they're targeted, being targeted, but behaviours do change significantly when someone's an anonymous. Um, the evidence is there. Um, and I said around the world. It's not just in one country or the other. Um, when it comes to the sweet spot, I sometimes think we're overthinking some of this. Would you allow your child to walk into a shop and buy or consume something like hardcore porn? If you wouldn't allow them to do that, to walk in a shop and buy that content, why are you allowing them to do it online. It's not the, it's not the medium, it's a message. I, this, I go back to this all the time. You have to look at what would you allow across platform, across mediums. You would not allow that elsewhere. Would you allow someone to walk, oh, knock on a front door, open that front door, and call the person who lives in that house, you, whatever it is you're calling them online? You wouldn't, because there is a Equality Act, the Discrimination Act, there's all this legislation that's out there. Yeah? You wouldn't allow it in person, the legislation is there, and the, um, I have to say, Malicious Communications Act needs updating. It was written in 1996, before yeah. the internet. It needs to be updated, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, it's such a, you know, the government went home because they don't have enough work to do. You know, uh, uh, update the Malicious Communications Act. Um, but I think it's actually, going back to that simple thing, would you allow it in another medium? And that would help us to filter some of what's happening online. Now, just before I go to questions, and I just want to come back, because I, I have a feeling that you have a, maybe have a slightly different view on regulation. What do you think about this question of, of, of regulation? Well, it, it's a really interesting one. So when it comes to children, um, much of what has been said I completely agree with, and I think it is you know, really shocking and disgraceful what under-16s in particular have access to. And um, yes, there are filters that parents can put on the internet. Um, and I do think there's a conversation to be had about digital liter literacy, as you mentioned, particularly for parents, um, to have a greater role in, in what their children are accessing um, online. But I think when it comes to uh, <coughs> adults, from what I've seen already, um, as I spoke about, I think you know, the, the evidence that um, social media companies or politicians um, have the ability to be able to determine what we should and shouldn't have access to. Um, it, it, it doesn't really seem to, to, to stack up. I mean, I mentioned the point about COVID. Um, I mentioned the point about um, gender. Um, and there are many other examples as well. I mean, we talk about misinformation, but I actually worry that the definition of misinformation has actually expanded quite significantly. I think misinformation is, is something quite specific. It's the intentional and systematic um, spreading of false information for the purposes of uh, misleading. But actually, oftentimes, people can just be wrong. People can make mistakes uh, and, and correct themselves, but that is labeled misinformation. Um, so I think that when, we, when it comes to harm, when it comes to misinformation, I think we need to have really clear watertight definitions or what it does end up doing is opening to abuse for whatever political agenda is the dominant orthodoxy of the day and, and I think that is a real risk. I mean that's often the argument when it comes, oh yeah, that's an, um, in terms of, you know, that's an area when it ever comes to sort of, you know, who determines what is freedom of expression or press regulation, there is always that anxiety about who is the ruling party of the day you may have a particularly subjective sort of view on that. Right, let's take some more questions. Um, uh, yeah, lady at the... 
Oh my goodness, someone's, okay, okay, well hang on a minute, You're, we're going to do this girl, we're going to, hang on, hang on, hang on, just because you should, wait, 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 we're going to do this person here and then we'll come to you, okay? Lady, yeah, lady over here, yeah. Um, hi, thank you to all the panellists for interesting discussion. What's your name? Molly Foster, sorry. Molly, my thanks. Um, so my question kind of follows a little bit from uh, Inaya's point about recreating what we want in the real world, um, and also a little bit to Dr. Regger's point about you know, the actual structure of these things. And um, thinking about how we actually have these arguments, if the attention economy is favoring like shorter form structures, do we actually need to change the structure of how we argue? Or do we need to change the structure of social media so that it supports longer form arguments? Maybe that's a question for like... Brilliant someone. question, Molly. Um, and then, person, yep, person over there, yep, just see who you are and... Hi, I'm Florence, and I have a very similar question, actually. <laughs> um, this, oh, we're, we're agreeing. This is yes. good. This is good. This conversation has very much been about the dangers of the online world, but the subject is disagreeing well. And um, I'm a millennial. I'm in my mid-30s. And I feel that in the last 15 years, my capacity to debate with others has diminished as we've become more polarised from what I've, what I've taken from online world, um, I never really got debating in school and, and I feel that my capacity to debate with others ha has diminished as well. Um, and so I suppose what I was really hoping to, to hear from this panel was how do we disagree better? How do we, um, for the younger generations particularly, as you know, things are debated more online, which is, is less of a debate and it's more of a, this is my view and your view is wrong, how are we going to change that? How is that going to improve? How does it even improve for my generation, you know, let alone the younger generations? Okay, that's a brilliant question, Florence. Thank you so much for that. Um, right, I'm going to ask for some brevity from my uh, panellists because I know lots of people have got their... I can see you so away, but yeah, I will come to you. So just... Uh, but I think that's a... a well, um, I'm going to come to you first about Molly's question because I think that's such a great question. And I certainly know from my time in politics... I know that, for example, when I was advising politicians and, you know, you had the rise of social media, people started to change how they debated even in politics to fit the structure because of the rise of the viral clip, for example, and things like that. But what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think both these questions are really nicely connected, um, very well curated. Um, so so the question is is really around how we've, we've changed the way we think almost, right? That we're, we're now kind of, we have these bite-sized arguments and we're fed bite-sized arguments and that's what we consume. So that's what we now echo within our society. Um, the other thing, and the, the comment over here uh, spoke to it, I think really, really nicely, is that through information silos, we're actually consuming different content. So you are consuming completely different content through your feed than the person sitting next to you on the bus. You're consuming different truths, different realities, and you have then, as, as a result, you have completely different reference points. And that's different from when we just had five channels, right? And that we were consuming generally fairly similar content that we then would discuss. And I think that that binary approach, that polarity, as you really rightly have, have pointed out, where we have a very polarized society now, where we consume completely different truths, has impacted the way we communicate with each other. And it has impacted our politics, where we see people being pushed more and more to the extremes. But not only are we consuming different truths, but we're consuming them in very bite-sized packages. So the way that we communicate our different polarities is much more, it's brief, and it's much more argumentative. And I, I think, I, I notice within my own classes, I, I teach master's level here, that it has impacted even debating theoretical debate within our classrooms. And I think that that's something that we should be all very concerned about. Okay. We need to, and I, what, what do you think about that? Because there's two, you know, as I say, the questions dovetail to, to, together. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that actually social media, so I would disagree with Caitlin. Um, I think that actually social media has um, 
exacerbated and, and re-entrenched uh, trends that were already existing. And I think one of the biggest trends um, in political discourse that I think has actually really been corrosive in terms of how we do public debate has been the rise of identity politics. And what I mean by that is that I think that um, particular identities have become politicised. And um, if you disagree with uh, someone's view on a particular issue, I think people often now increasingly see that as an attack on who they are as a person, an attack on their identity, how they see themselves fundamentally. And I mean, if someone disagrees with me or my views on, on race or, or, or whatever, or, or Brexit or whatever that might be, um, that's kind of part of living in a, in a diverse democratic society. And so I regularly kind of speak to people who do say that they don't have anybody else um, that thinks differently in their social groups. When actually, you know, if you're at a dinner table, you know, at Christmas with your family, you might have, you know, your uncle, your aunt or your grandparents that had lots of different views and, and we should be able to kind of tolerate that. But I think that the rise in the way that people um, attach so much uh, a sense of identification with their political views um, has meant that it's actually become much more difficult to have thorny debates that might be about identity-based issues. And then just secondly, I think that we've also seen a rise in, I think, something called kind of compelled speech. So some of the big debates you've seen over the last few years, whether that was Black Lives Matter in 2020, or more recently with the kind of um, Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, one of the really interesting things that has been quite stark to me is I've seen people, if you don't say something, then that means that um, you, know, you are immoral or you are, are wrong. You get people messaging saying, why haven't you said this? Why haven't you said that? And that only feeds a kind of cycle of a simplistic conversation because you may just genuinely not know or you may not be interested in a particular subject and that should be fine. Um, but currently now it seems like it's not particularly amongst the younger generations. And so I think that identity politics and the kind of demand that everybody must um, have a political view um, means that we have a much more simplistic and, and polarised conversation. Some research again that shows that younger children are being asked to make decisions and take sides at a much younger age than they did before. They're children, but being asked at sort of, you know, 9, 10, 11, quite political and adult um, and, and grown up and social questions. And, and emotionally, they're not ready. So they're just taking, they're, baking, they're being forced into making a decision and taking a side when they really are children. So that's one of the other things to think about is that, you know, they should be allowed to be children and not being asked to make all these, you know, take a side. It's always take a side. What do you think about gender, race, you know, or whatever? They're children. Um, and one of the other things, your, your question about disagreeing, I go back to my first point, don't leave the stage. Don't let others. I think we have to reach over to those who don't agree with us and take the time to do that. Even if it's just one person a day, it's worth me speaking to that one person a day who doesn't agree with me. Because I think you, you can't change everything right now, but we can have that one conversation. I think it's really important. And to challenge people and not take it from their bite size to say, well, you know, if you think that, well, why do you think that? And, and don't do it in an aggressive way because... Can I, can I come back on you? So you're talking about sort of taking people on one, one person at a time presumably to win them over. What about the fact that you may do really good chatting with people on the doorstep and they might just fundamentally disagree with everything you That's stand absolutely for? That's fine. That's absolutely fine because I'm a human being and they can see I'm not being aggressive to them. I, um, again, I, I'm always obsessed with research because we can get, our perceptions can take over and that's not a good thing when we're making decisions and having conversations. But actually there's a research that also shows when somebody is going onto their social media cha channels, they're already in a heightened state. They're in a much more heightened state than when they're having conversations face to face. So there's something about going on that you're already almost physically, physically and emotionally gearing up to almost have, you know, it's something about the medium that takes away the emotion. So, so you know, that's a take in mind. But you have to reach over and talk to each other. It's really that simple. Shreya, what, what are your thoughts? I just really struck by what Flo, Florence was just saying there about how even if her generation, like, debate and disagreeing with people has sort of been... Squash. I mean, that kind of themes in what you, what, with what you, you were saying about your own lived experience. Yeah, I think that um, there really needs to be more time spent on trying to understand the variety of different opinions that exist. And I actually just want to touch on what Inaya said about the pressure that people 
uh, increasingly having to say something. I remember a few years ago, I can't remember exactly what political issue it was, but there was something that was happening on Instagram and there was this trend of tagging people who hadn't said anything about it. And I deleted Instagram at the time, but when I went back, I noticed I'd been tagged on someone's story and I was like, oh, what's this about? And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. It was because you hadn't said anything. And I felt such a pressure to speak on something and repost things that I had no idea about. I didn't, I wasn't educated on. Yeah, I was reposting things blindly because there was so much pressure on doing so. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, there has been a reduction in um, tolerance to, towards people even attempting to understand because, um, again, a few years ago, there was um, another issue and um, I had a book on my shelf that didn't align with the political views that me and my friends have. And um, I, think it was a, I think it was a book on my shelf or someone that I followed, or something I'd liked, something like that. And someone came up to me and they were like, oh, why have you, why have you liked that? Why do you, why do you have that? And um, I immediately became so defensive. And I don't think that's what should happen, thinking back at it a few years later. Um, we should be trying to under expand our understanding of different subjects. We should be trying to um, educate ourselves. And that does involve trying to understand different perspectives. I have a variety of different books on my shelf from people I don't necessarily agree with, but I try to understand why they think the way that they do. And I think that's extremely important for debate to try and be educated on these subjects as much as possible before you jump into a very polarized discussion where you might be saying things that you don't really know the context of. And it happens a lot these days. There's so much pressure to say things and repost things. And it's quite easy to do on Instagram as well with things like infographics, um, which may not necessarily communicate the whole picture. Um, and yeah, I think that, that aspect of there being a lot of pressure is quite detrimental to debate as well. No, I, I think that they're all very, very good points. And as you say, sometimes you can almost be sort of um, criticised or cancelled for something you, you haven't said. Or on the bookshelf, is funny, there's actually been quite a lot of people that have had massive torrents of abuse for just what's on their bookshelf. Yes. And it's like, it was a present. I didn't even buy the book, basically. Um, right, I'm conscious of time. Right, gentleman there, he's been waiting very patiently. Um, let's get a microphone. and. Um, Yes, you do need a microphone, so that's how we're doing it. So, um, yes, thanks very much. So, could you say your name and then ask your question? Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll try and get the distance right with the microphone. So you're uh, sounding my great. Is, my name is Anthony. Um, a quick point which may be helpful to the lady to your immediate right. My understanding is that disinformation is wrong information that is put out deliberately and maliciously, whereas misinformation is defined as wrong information that is put out accidentally. I, I, I read that recently somewhere, and I, I can't quite remember if you made that distinction, okay. but that, that may help. But okay. My main point is that as somebody who, whom, who, whom has been walking this planet for... 74 years, I can make a lot of comparisons uh, back to the days when we were still using coal to heat our houses okay. and so forth. Anthony, I'm going to have to just trouble you to get to your question, sir, because it's, we, just have, we haven't got a lot of time left. So if well, we it, question, it's, it's not you. a question. I'm just saying that back in those days, we had an adage called, is man controlling machines or are machines controlling man? Now, aside of the fact that we've got to change the word man to person these days, aside of that, my point is, I'm concerned about the manipulation of minds that's, that's Great. been suggested. And as long as we keep in mind the question, does this stack up with common sense? Excellent. We should, we should now, be safe. I'm going to be make a common sense into it. Give, give Anthony a round of applause for his very good common sense question there. Okay, Anthony, great common sense. Um, let's have a, another... Um, let's, have, let's have a gentleman over there. Keep your hand up, so with the white shirt. Yeah, there, yeah. If you can keep your questions brief, because I want to try and get through quite a few, because lots of people have... And I've got a few coming through on the iPad now as well. I think most discussions... What's your name, oh, sir? Alan Coker. Sorry? Alan Coker. Alan, OK, great. Most discussions we have face-to-face, -face, and for me, being older as well, I remember most of my discussions were face-to-face -face, um, when I was younger. You get a lot of feedback from people's body language yeah. and facial expressions. And I fear now that 
especially since since COVID and we do a lot more meetings online, and we meet less and less face to face, we've lost that and we're not picking up those cues anymore. And we're beginning to forget how to use them. And for our children, it's even worse because they're not even learning to develop those cues yeah. while they're growing up. Great point, Alan. That's a really, really, really excellent point. I kind of felt they were more sort of observations. So I'm going to just, because we, we actually, I don't want to spread any misinformation or disinformation. I, my iPad was broken. <laughs> Speaking of, obviously, we're going to reg, I'm going to regulate tech. I can't even work the iPad. So that's all going uh, very, very well. So I'm just going to do a few questions, really good questions that will come in from um, Slido. Um, how can the online world be used to dis disagree well and also move forward together? Is there genuine exchange of ideas or is it just people shouting their um, views? And then I'm going to wrap in another question, um, which is, are arguments now based more on emotion than fact? And I think that's such a brilliant observation and question, whoever made that. Um, and I'll come to you. I'm probably not going to go to everybody because I want to get through as many questions as possible. Brief answers, if you will. Uh, sorry, could you just repeat the first question? Yeah, basically, um, is there a, do you think there's a genuine um, exchange of views on social media or is it just people yelling at each other? Um, so I, I think sometimes, sometimes it is a genuine um, place where people uh, meet and encounter people that um, they hadn't come across before, encounter ideas that they hadn't come across before and do feel a genuine sense of, um, you know, affinity and belonging. Um, as I, in the beginning, I mentioned the podcasting space. Some of the um, biggest uh, places where people uh, access ideas now is through podcasting. I think, you know, whatever people think of Joe Rogan, he has millions of listeners. And um, many people feel that um, the creation of some of those spaces is a response to the fact that debate was previously narrowed. So I do think that um, there are, we have to remember that there are, um, opportunities that social media and the internet um, has brought. But as I have mentioned throughout this conversation, I do think that we have to create those in-person spaces. And you know, young people was mentioned and the, the lack of in-person spaces they have. You know, I think this has a real impact on a generation. We see the rise in in seldom and different things where particularly young men um, are isolated, alone, in, on the internet with very little human interaction and, and can be radicalised in, in many different ways. And one of the ways that we can combat that is for people to have real, meaningful, authentic relationships in person. OK, great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very brief because we've got so many questions. So I'm going to ask my panellists to be very brief with their answers because so many brilliant questions have, co have come in. Um, Kate, I'm going to come to you. Can we disagree well in the workplace? Because you often feel there's quite a lot of conflict in workplaces at the moment around some of these um, debates. What do you think about that? Um, I don't know if I'm an... I don't know. I think that might sit beyond my expertise. Um, can we disagree, disagree well in the workplace? I, um, I think... Yes, I think that there was a brilliant comment about how COVID and the, the kind of cults of the online Zoom meeting or the online Teams meeting has really changed working relationships. And I think this is particularly salient for mentorship and for bringing young people up into the workplace. At the moment, we just don't have that in-person interaction, those water cooler moments, those end of meeting moments where so much learning takes place. And I think that we, I think if we want to move people away from screen dependence, if we want to kind of detox we really need to build in social structures again, because that, that's really lacking. We need mentorship, and that's not happening, and it needs to be happening in the workplace as well. Excellent. Uh, Shri, I'll come to you um, for this. Uh, again, a brilliant, brilliant question. We often equate dissenting opinions with personal criticism, i.e. feeling criticised ourselves, criticising others. How can we separate opinions versus our personal selves? Because that's such a great question, because that's often at the nub of all of this. It's like, you, if you, you want to have a robust debate, but on, people take it quite personally, and it gets very personal with other people, doesn't it? Yeah, I think something that I'm sure some people in the audience can relate to is when you have um, discussions with your parents, and it feels like a personal attack, that you know, you're disagreeing with me, um, and it feels like it's because I'm young, I don't, you know, that, that's what it feels like. And it can happen online as well. Um, 
where you're having a discussion with someone and they disagree and you feel that they just disagree with, because your identity is so tied to the side of the political debate that you're taking on, then there's a big gulf in between the two sides of a debate. I think it does, it ties into that idea as well. Um, and I think the way to sort of combat that is um, by trying to understand where the other side is coming from, um, trying to get them to dissect their argument a bit. Um, it's an important part of debating, trying to persuade someone of not only your opinion, but also trying to understand why they are saying, I've said it so many times tonight as well, but I'll, you know, I'll go back to that same idea that you have to understand where they're coming from, maybe the social environment that they grew up in, um, all of these things that feed into their argument. And I think it's, it's um, a really important thing to do if you want to try and make it less of a personal attack. I think it's all, it, it's all about perspective, how you perceive the argument and trying to combat that in a way that it doesn't feel like a personal attack to you. And I think it's something you have to do proactively. Okay, don't take this personally, but it's time to wrap that answer up. Okay, great. Right, uh, now, Gina, it's like the perfect question has sort of landed for you. Um, from someone who is anonymous. Um, <laughs> but we love you, it's good, it's a great question. Uh, to what extent has an economy which has been stagnating since 2008 had a detrimental effect on the mood of the Vox Populi and contributed to all this antagonism online? Oh, wow, now there's a big question. Um, so, we'll brief answer. Yes, the mismanagement of the, of the effects of the global financial crisis is where that started the tail that started wagging the things that happened that we then saw in 2016, in my view. The poor political choices when it came to choosing austerity rather than investments at a time when we had low interest rates and we could have actually fixed roofs rather than um, damaging whole houses. Um, yes, so I would say that the mismanagement of the economy after the financial crisis has definitely led to where we are today. But I'd also say that, um, you know, when, a, when an economy is not working, society is not working, and we choose to return on each other, we have social degradation, and that's what actually we're seeing. So it is, you know, poverty, all the things that are now being a, a social, a, a, an effect of that poor management is leading to where we are. And, you know, um, I, I just want to say one couple of things quickly, that, you know, the whole idea of the conversations we're having online, please do not forget, offline, you know, the bullying is increasing, misogyny is increasing. These are, the, there are mirror effects that are happening in real life as well as online. And that also is about the lack of respect that's happening offline and on, it's of course being happening online because it's happening offline. And also the attack on experts, you know, everyone on, an, on the internet is not an expert and doesn't know everything, but apparently they do. But, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, we have got to respect experts, we've got to respect each other, we've got to have respect for the fact that um, people will have different emotions, different points of views, you know, there is so much that we can get from that, from, from being, going back to real core values of what we stand for as humans and as social beings. Brilliant stuff there. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting the sign here. We're all here. We've all been agreeing well, I'm being told like this right now. So look, we've come to the end of our time. What a, a fascinating thought-provoking and illuminating discussion that was. Thank you all for your engagement. Thank you for your brilliant questions and observations and questions online. And um, before we invite the provost up to say a few words to close the event, please just give a huge, brilliant round of applause for Anaya, Shreya, Caitlin and Gina. So I've been assigned the undoable task of drawing together the threads of the conversation. And because that is undoable, I thought what I would just do is give a little bit of my own reflection, the impact of the conversation on me. So um, I have eight children, it's my claim to fame, and there was a lot of talk about children. Um, that they range from five to 31. And as I was listening, it just occurred to me what a very different social worlds um, they've grown up in. And yet, in my day job, so much of what we do in education has stayed the same. And so the question that I kept asking myself is, how do we respond to this different social world, in particular in relation to disagreeing well, in the educational system and what might we be doing better? And there are three things that really troubled me. The first 
was when Shreya said, and this was particularly chilling, well, online I'm in the algorithm loop, but it's kind of the same in person at university because I have to work hard to meet people who disagree with me. That was kind of chilling. Or when Anaya talked about self-censorship, not only in the online world, but also in the university world and more generally. And that's a part of the conversation we've been having in the Disagreeing Well program. How do you curate pluralism? How do you make sure that the university is a place where you genuinely encounter the other? How do you do that both in student life but in the classroom? How do you recruit for methodological and viewpoint pluralism in disciplines? What, what are the pedagogical and epistemic duties of a teacher in relation to those positions with which she most disagrees? Should a student know what she thinks? Or should she be equipping a student to choose, um, uh, uh, to choose her own understanding, to create her own understanding? And so this question about what curated pluralism might look like for us, I think is very important because they're the skills that young people are going to need for the online world. Similarly, the questions from Molly and from Florence and from others about what disagreeing well looks like in this context. We've sort of assumed that we know what the epistemic virtues look like. We haven't consciously taught them in the way that perhaps we ought to be doing. Um, and, and it was interesting how you kept all coming back to the high school debate, because that's the sort of default place where we think we do it, right? And there are advantages to it. Sometimes it makes you inhabit the viewpoint of the other. But of course, the great irony of the high school debate is it's the ultimate polarity. It's negative and affirmative, yes or no. It's the kind of conversation you get online that is precisely the conversation you don't want. So, absent the title, um, uh, I support our debating program, I'm very, very <laughs> fond of uh, Absent the titled methodology of the debate, how do we teach the epistemic virtues consciously, um, thereby equip, equipping students better to d deal with the real world, to deal with the online world? And the last one is the one for which I will get online abuse, but this is kind of, because it's really dodgy and I'm not even sure where we go and I'm kind of groping towards it, but universities in the mid 20th century became incredibly technocratic places. Universities historically were not only interested in instruction, but in the languages, in terms of the language, the, the languages that make the distinction, education more broadly, there was a sense that somehow we ought to be about moral formation. And it's our students and staff who are watching that violent pornography on the internet. What kinds of conversations are we having in the moral formation space? Not necessarily, not that involve preaching at our students but that encourage them to think about their worldviews and their understandings, not just of the true and the false, but also of the right and the wrong. What's the place of education, and particularly university education, not just in instruction, but in education more broadly and in moral formation? How do we curate pluralism? How do we teach the epistemic virtues? And do we have any role in this tricky, tricky process of moral formation that might better equip my children to deal with the kind of junk that they are potentially exposed to in the internet? These are really challenging questions and they're ones that came back again and again for me. And so I really would like to thank you, Aisha, for doing such a phenomenal job of <laughs> sharing the event. And Anaya, Caitlin, uh, Matt, Gina, and Shreya for, um, for your contribution. It's been a really rich afternoon's conversation. Thanks very much. Yeah.